Hello, and welcome to your weekly episode of Food for the Belly and the Brain. We're kicking off with the world's first for you from New Zealand, where the New Zealand King Salmon Company has been quietly working away on a monster of a project. They're breeding a rare type of giant salmon that weighs in at over 30 pounds. It's humongous. The fish are called Tai, and the name means chief, and they were first found in British Columbia, rarely seen and hardly ever caught. They're often mistaken for normal salmon as they're caught before being able to grow to full size. But a few years ago, the extremely clever team at Aura King, a part of New Zealand King Salmon, came up with the idea to farm these truly king-sized salmon in the pristine waters of New Zealand's South Island. It's a fascinating and ambitious project that is now coming to fruition. Just one of these beauties can have a price tag of around $1,000, depending on size. They're bred in small quantities and harvested by hand and demand is high. With the current trend for fish butchery and extremely creative seafood cookery, chefs are beginning to experiment with dry aging these beautiful creatures. And at the forefront of this technique is Chef Liao of the Joint Eatery in California, who ages the Taiyi for at least 45 days. Now Liao says because the salmon are so massive, this allows adequate time for science to do its thing and transform the protein into something truly spectacular. Becoming known as the Wagyu of the sea, the Taiyi gives chefs the opportunity to think really big, as you can see here with Chef Timothy Hollingworth of LA's Otium restaurant. Because of the longer life cycle, their oil profile is more developed, particularly in the belly. However, the taste is remarkably delicate. The Taiyi project is ambitious, and it sees the Aura King team proudly delivering a unique taste of New Zealand to the world. Now then, as I'm recording this, World's 50 Best are all set to announce their selection of the World's 50 Best Restaurants for 2021. And a huge congratulations to Noma in Copenhagen for landing again in the number one spot. I'll have a more in-depth look at the reactions to this prestigious list for you next week. But if you've not already done so, please head over to finedininglovers.com and nominate your favourite chef for their Food for Thought Award. As a part of the world's biggest search for the next best young chef by the San Pellegrino Young Chef Academy 2021. The Food for Thought Award sees 12 regional finalists giving you their point of view through 12 incredible dishes, from family and food memories and local culture and products, through to showcasing sustainability, these incredible young talents have created some really powerful stories through their food. I was just so lucky to be invited to cheer on our New Zealand contingent as they competed in the Pacific Region Finals in Sydney in 2019. These young chefs, they are the future of our industry, so it's so important that we celebrate and support them. And uh, heads up New Zealand, make sure you pull your finger out and get in there and cast a vote for our own Abhijit Day. You only have until October 24, so head over to finedininglovers.com and I'll put those links in the program information below. <laughs> Now this is an interesting little snippet for you. The world's first robotic beehive is here. Israeli startup BeeWise has come up with the concept that they call Bee Home, and it allows beekeepers to manage their hives remotely. At the moment, we've currently got predictions that by 2119, we may not have any bees left at all. So could this be the answer to a massive problem? The company is saying that their autonomous beehive, the first of its kind, monitors every bee providing them with real-time care and support. They say they're revolutionising beekeeping and saving billions of bees' lives. Beewives are currently looking into the North American market and looking to Australia and New Zealand next. Now I have a question for you this week. Do you or would you drink wine from a can? As a cork sniffing, glass twirling wine lover, I've been laughing at the concept of canned wine for years. But the pandemic and the resulting surge in online shopping seems to have upped the ante for wine in a tinny big time. Now it stands to reason that a man like Oscar winning film director Francis Ford Coppola would love a good read. But did you know that as the founder of the family Coppola wineries, he's believed to have been a major influence in jumpstarting the move to canned wine way back in 2004. Francis launched a canned version of his bottled sparkling wine, Sophia Blanc de Blancs, named for his daughter director Sophia Coppola, and it sold out immediately. A Sophia Rosé followed and Coppola was clearly onto something 
He was aiming to attract a new, younger consumer with packaging that took all of the intimidation and snobbery out of wine. Now in 2017, in the US, there were still only 68 canned wine brands, whereas at the beginning of this year there were over 235, with that number still rising. So why are we seeing this surge in the popularity of wine in a can? Perhaps the product targets a younger consumer that's not yet been exposed to a traditional wine culture. It certainly puts to bed the problem of wanting to consume just one glass. It's lighter than a bottle, easier to pop in your handbag or your backpack, endlessly recyclable, faster to chill, and especially with regards to the spritzers, a low alcohol and calorie count might give us the impression that we're making a better choice. Although slower to take off across Europe, it's pretty clear that millennials and female consumers are the core target across the board. You can't get much more girly than giggle water, named after the American slang term for alcoholic drinks that was coined back in the Prohibition era and promoted in the UK with just stick in a straw and go for your life. Australia is recording year-on-year -year growth of 30% in the canned wine stakes and although a little late to the party, we're seeing some of the big guns in New Zealand join in. Brancott Estate has an East Coast Pinot Gris and a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc at 13% alcohol volume and a lighter version with their Flight Rosé and Flight Sauvignon Blanc at 9%. Crafters Union are spreading the message of no glass, no problem with a colourful range of wines including Rosé and Pinot Gris from the Hawke's Bay and a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc plus a bubbly fusion of what they call their artisanal spritzers. Joy are putting in some serious commitment no bottles at all for this brand, only cans of sparkling white and rosé, plus there's cans of Savvy, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay and, interestingly, as we're not yet seeing a great deal of choice in the canned reds, what they call an earthy and audacious Pinot Noir. Now, Wellington's craft beer guru's Garage Project made their first foray into canned wine with their Fairy Bread series and their latest is this little number called Good Vibrations. It's a concept where macerated Sauvignon Blanc gets fermented on mango, passion fruit and pineapple on top of a bed of lactose. And Garage Project co-founder Joss Ruffle tells me he thinks there's still huge scope for more thoughtful and contemporary canned wine, cocktails or spritzers. So what do you think? Can you see yourself drinking wine from a can? Can you be brave enough to admit to already doing so in the comments below? There is no denying that what was once a non-category and then just a little bit of a fad, is now attracting a lot of attention. And I know if you're looking at all of these brand labels, you're thinking that I'm probably raking in the cash now. You need to know that this program is not commercially funded. This is just me giving you some of the things that have caught my eye this week. So by giving me a like and a subscribe, you're helping me to know whether to keep going and make another episode for you. Now I've had a few requests for cookbook reviews. And this, not so little beauty from Neil Perry, well this landed on my desk this week. And um, you can see already from my collection that I'm already a bit of a fan of this Aussie rock star chef. So don't be fooled by the title, Everything I Love to Cook. Yes, many of the recipes may be recipes that we've already seen before, but Neil is an absolute master of flavour. And the recipes, well each one has that little piece of that Perry magic to dress it up take it to the next level and make it sing. Just have a look at this crispy tuna toasty with sam sauce and this most delicious looking miso glazed squid, yum. The deep, dark, rich red curry of that toothfish. Just look at the caramel braise on this pork belly. The perfectly tart, lemon tart, a sensational black forest all dressed in white and Neil's passion fruit souffle, come on. I tell you, a book of Neil's favourite things to cook at home is a definite keeper. You can get in there and soak up all of the tips and tricks that this amazing Aussie chef has curated over a stellar career. It's beautifully styled by Emma Knowles and cleverly photographed by Petrina Tinsley to portray just the right amount of casual and cool. Now I've got a copy of Everything I Love to Cook to give away to our Aussie or New Zealand audience thanks to the good people at Allen & Unwin. Just hit subscribe and let me know in the comments section below if there's anything on your radar that you'd like to see featured on this little weekly food and drink roundup and I'll draw our winner next week. As the pandemic continues, the question of whether hospitality venues should require their guests to show proof of vaccination has been a hugely contentious issue. 
New York became the first city in the US to issue a mandate requiring proof that customers had received at least one dose of a virus vaccine before gaining entry to an indoor restaurant. As I speak, the rules vary widely around the world, but it does feel that more and more countries are looking to vaccination requirements in a bid to bring the pandemic to heel. Here in New Zealand, the government is still consulting on whether vaccine passports will work within the hospo sector. And well-known and respected chef Simon Galt has spoken out this week. He's saying that he hopes the government will step up and grow some balls and enforce the passport so that people don't have to decide for themselves. However, there is a question of how this might all be policed, and it's a big one. How will it be enforced? Are front of house teams going to be comfortable and safe at the first point of engagement? Will we, the customer, behave ourselves? How do you feel about all of this? Your thoughts would be valuable if you'd like to leave them below in the comments. Every single one of us is going to have to play an important role in the hospitality equation. It may take years for the industry to regain its footing, and it's not going to be a one-way street. We all have to do our part to be better guests. I'm going to leave you this week with a bunch of terrific Aussie chefs who got behind the recent Put a Jab on the Menu hospitality campaign in Australia. With every week of lockdown over there costing the hospitality industry $428 million in lost bookings and events, and that's in Sydney and Melbourne alone, $428 million lost. The campaign was the brainchild of creative director David Nobe, and chef Guillaume Brahimi stepped up as executive producer, with unanimous support from the hospital industry Australia-wide. This video is it's a fantastic example of weaponising the tribe of hospitality to tell a compelling story about COVID and its impact, producing emotional content that could only be created by the people who are actually living it. Catch you next week. We were born here. Boiled here. And baked here. Forged amongst the bubbling pots. And spitting rocks. From the pier. To the paddock. From the pan to the plate. We made our bones here. And we cooked them too. Without power. Without sleep. But always with each other. Shoulder to shoulder. Good times and the bad. And right now, for us, it's as bad as it gets. Closed doors and cold hobs. All over Australia. All over again. So if you're as hungry as we are, to get back in the kitchen. Put a jab on your menu.